Hey guys, hope everybody's doing well. Um, can you hear me okay? Just uh, type in the chat box. Let me know that you can hear me. Good morning. Good morning, Eucharist. Good morning, Donnie. Good morning, Cherry. Cherry? Sorry. Uh, Kirk? All right, good to see you guys. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, just let me know when you can see my screen. All right, good. Okay, good, good, good. So I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, Market continues to go higher here. Amazingly, since last uh, Thursday morning. Good to go. Awesome. Hey, Pete. So, uh, you guys last week requested that I go through uh, each column of the spreadsheet. Is that something you guys still want to do? Okay. <clears throat> okay. We can definitely do that. Um, I'm 
just going to keep an eye on this trade here. I'm short the YMNQ spread. Uh, so I just want to keep an eye on that. But it's looking good so far. All right, we can do that. Let's take a look at the spreadsheet, and I'll go through it column by column. Um, now, there are some columns that are hidden in the spreadsheet, and so a lot of the calculations are done in those hidden cells and columns, but I'll go through the ones that are visible so that you have something to uh, refer to, like Pete says. Um, let's start with the very far left column and we'll just go through each one. If you guys have any questions in the meantime, go ahead and put them in the chat box and just let me know. If I'm not clear about something, just let me know if you have, you know, any questions at all. Um, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, since I developed the spreadsheet, I, I know the basics of it and then the more advanced algorithms and uh, formulas that are in the spreadsheet. I'm not really very familiar with uh, recurrent neural networks, which is a lot of what the uh, algorithms are, are built on. Um, but, you know, starting right from the left, we've got the input items. So the input items are the NYSC advancing issues. Now, these, hopefully everybody knows what the advancing issues is. That is the number of issues that are up on the day. So even if it's up by one cent, it is included in this number. Uh, if it's zero, if there's absolutely no advance for the day, then it's, it's called unchanged and it's not in this number. So in order for an issue to be included in the advancing issues, it has to be up by at least one cent. Um, same with declining issues, it has to be down by one cent to be included in that number. The NYC up volume is simply the volume that the number of issues, the advancing issues, had for that day. And so if it's unchanged, if the issue was unchanged for the day, it's not included in that number. The NYC down volume, uh, same thing for the declining issues. That's the amount of volume that went into those declining issues on the day. If it was unchanged, it's not in this volume number. Uh, and then, of course, we have the Dow change and the S&P 500 change. Now, the TS signal and the strength is the same one that's over here in the main uh, body, so I'll cover that when I get there. Um, the total number of issues is just the addition of the advancing issues and the declining issues. That's all it is. So these are the number of issues that made a change for that particular day. And then the total volume is just the total volume of the up volume and the down volume. So it's the number, it's the amount of volume that went into those issues that traded either up or down on the day. The up V ratio is the amount of volume that went into the total volume that went into the advancing issues. So in this case, it would be the total volume. Uh, divided by the up volume. So we take the up volume, we uh, divide it by the total volume to get a percentage. This is actually a percentage. So it would se you'd say that 70% of the volume for that day compri was comprised of the volume that went into the up issues. And 30% of the volume for that day went into the volume uh, that comprise the issues that were declining. So 70% of the issue, 70% of the volume for that day was advancing issues, which is the up volume ratio, and the down volume ratio was 30%. And they always add up to 100%. So in other words, you have total volume, how much of that volume was into the up issues, how much was into the down issues on a percentage basis. Uh, Pete asks, uh, seems like strong markets up down volume is quite a bit different than WSA. That's The reason for that is in the, um, uh, they take the volume as of about 530. 
And so it's not going to get all of the volume. The volume continues to come into the market until 8 p.m. And so if the Wall Street Journal is reporting it the very next day, um, or are you talking about the market WSJ website? Yeah. The website? Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on what time of day, I guess, you take the reading. They do it at 5.30 um, only to, in order to uh, make the spreadsheet available by 6 p.m. Uh, for the futures open. <clears throat> but the volume continues to move, to, it continues to um, update until 8 p.m. on the Wall Street Journal website. So it could be different. So if they find that any of the numbers are significantly different at 8 p.m., then they'll do an update to the spreadsheet. If there's not much of it, there's, if there's no difference, then they don't update it. A couple of times I know it's like, yeah, I know you're rounding down, but uh, like if, like a different uh, digit, like a, if it was a hundred and something thousand, then it would be 70. So I, I'm, sometimes I, I wonder where they get the number from. Yeah, so the numbers, like I said, the, the volume continues to uh, accumulate until 8 p.m. and then all of the tr uh, after all the trades have been settled. <clears throat> so the numbers could be different than the ones that uh, are on the website by 8 p.m. Uh, so between 5.30 and 8 p.m., if there are any changes, then they update the spreadsheet and upload it to the, to the members area. But if there's no significant difference in the numbers as far as the uh, supply demand, the empty volatility, the pipeline, um, or any of the other algorithms, then uh, there's no other update. Um, so it's one of the things that I always recommend is that you take the um, uh, you take the numbers at 8 p.m. You take the numbers from the spreadsheet, but then update it yourself um, on the on the website, the market's uh, WSJ website. Uh, but it doesn't make, typically there's not a lot of volume. It just, uh, there's not a big change in the volume at all between 5.30 and 8 as far as the algorithm goes. The algorithm takes into consideration uh, the volume that is pretty much right at 5:30. <clears throat> so there's not a huge there's not a huge difference in the numbers, and if there is, they update it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so <clears throat> then they do the same. Well, the volume sequence uh, we left off with the down volume ratio. The volume sequence is simply the the uh, the difference between the up volume ratio and the down volume ratio. In one of the algorithms that they use, they also use the difference between the current day's up volume ratio and down volume ratio to the previous days. And they use that calculation in one of the algorithms. Uh, and then the same thing for the share ratio. So the up S ratio is the number of shares that advance for that day. And the down share S ratio is the number of shares that decline for the day. So of the advancing issues, <clears throat> Divided by the total issues, you get the number of uh, the ratio of uh, issues that were higher for the day compared to the total number of issues. And so you can see that the volume, a lot of the calculations have to do with um, uh, divergences. So what they'll do is they'll take a look at the up volume, the, the up volume ratio and compare it to the up. Uh, share ratio and say, hey, if there's if they're about the same, uh, then then okay, if that happens, then this happens, and if they're not the same or there's a huge difference between these two, then something else happens, and so it's an if then statement in the algorithm. Like I said, don't don't talk to me about algorithms because I'm not really sure, uh, but anyway, I know that that's one of the calculations that they use. They use a comparison to the previous day. They also do a comparison to look for divergences between the up volume ratio and the up share ratio. 
Um, and then the same thing with the uh, share ratio, the up share ratio, down share ratio, they subtract the two to get this number. They do a comparison between the previous days and the current day, and they do the same thing for the sequence, the share sequence. So the sequence, um, you can see, you know, it, it declined here from 0.49 to 0.39 to yesterday's 0.37. And then what they do is they use those numbers to determine if there's any divergences or anomalies in the data to give us a clue that, you know, there's a possible market reversal um, or a continuation of the advance. Okay, then we get into this, the actual signals. So anything after this black column and the gray column are the signals that are generated by the inputs. And so these are the only inputs that they use. They don't use any other inputs, same ones that you would input. Price data, up-down issues, advancing issues, declining issues, volume. And then um, the very first column here is the average volume per share. And so they take the total number of issues and divide it into the total volume, and that gives you this number the average volume per share, um, it, which is kind of, kind of interesting because during times of high volatility, typically that's over 1.5 million shares a day. Um, yesterday was very low. The day before that, the average volume per share on the NYSE was very low. And um, like they said in the weekend newsletter, it's typical for this time of year, the last two weeks of August especially, that uh, <clears throat> these numbers are extremely low. A lot of traders, a lot of the um, uh, large traders, institutional traders, hedge funds, um, they're on vacation, they're not trading quite as much. Um, also retail traders, they're, you know, they're on vacation the last two weeks of August, which is, you know, pretty traditional uh, time to take vacations in the summer. And uh, so that's why the volume is low. So probably now until after, uh, what is it, Labor Day? Labor Day in the U.S. <clears throat> yeah, Labor Day is the, is the third this year. So probably that volume number is not going to start picking up until the 4th of September. Um, and then we just have a repeat of the S&P 500 and Dow change, and then we have the supply and demand index. So the supply and demand index, just like the um, uh, just like the TOS script that they came out with on the supply and demand, it measures it measures the amount of buying or selling at any one particular time in the market. Um, uh, basically, providing you with a net difference between the amount of bullish buying and those who are buying and those who are selling the bearish side. And so what it'll do is this is only end of day data, uh, but the script that was created gives you a uh, up to the minute, uh, <clears throat> an up to the minute uh, view of exactly what's happening in the market, whether people are buying or selling in general. So whether it's institutions, retail buyers, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, in this case, we opened this morning, the supply demand was about 5.7, it's been rising, it's now 7.3. Well, at the very end of the day, whatever is recorded uh, for after all the volume is in, after all the number of issues is in, it's recorded in the supply and demand index number. Um, the nice thing about the script is that you can actually see it in real time on a five minute, one minute, 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour chart, whatever you want to choose. And it's this exact same algorithm. So the algorithm that they use for the supply and demand index on TOS is the same one that they're using in the spreadsheet. Um, and then we get to MT volatility. And MT volatility is their proprietary script for uh, determining. Uh, it's not like it's not it's not like the VIX. So the VIX 
of course, is a registered trademark of the CBOE. Uh, but the calculation for the VIX is quite a bit different because it uses options in order to determine volatility in the market. So they'll take a look at options, both calls and puts, and they'll say, okay, if prices are rising on both calls and puts, uh, and this is just a really basic overview of the formula. In fact, I have a video on volatility. Hopefully all you guys have seen that. Um, but the calculation for the uh, calculating the VIX is based on the calls and puts and the rise in premium over uh, a Black Scholes model or whatever model that they're, they're using. I think they're using Black Scholes. But if there's a premium in the calls and puts, it, in, it means that volatility is increasing. And the only reason that vol the uh, premium of the calls and puts would rise is because Traders are becoming fearful, so they're selling calls, or they're buying calls, or they're buying puts, or they're creating straddles or spreads to take advantage of a potential drop in the market. So they're buying up puts, maybe they're selling some calls, so you've got market makers that are selling calls to retail traders who are trying to protect their portfolio, or retail traders are in there buying puts, and so they have to constantly bid up the put prices and the premiums rise. In either case, if premiums rise on the S&P 500 index options, then um, it indicates that there's, a, there's fear in the market. So uh, traders are indicating that there's a potential drop coming and they're trying to protect their portfolios by using call and put options. Okay. Um, so, but in the market, mar uh, market time or volatility is a little bit different. What it's doing is it's measuring, it's measuring the rate of change of uh, MTSD. I mean, this is, this is where it gets a little complicated because what it's doing is it's saying, okay, if the supply and demand index, um, if there's an anomaly in the supply and demand index, we want to see what that looks like in comparison with um, the bullish and bearish uh, herding. So the formula itself has to do with both uh, supply and demand and the bullish and bearish herding uh, formulas. And so if there's, more, uh, if there's more underlying bearishness, if there's more bearish herding that isn't showing up on the indicator, then it's going to show up in the MT volatility. So as this continues to rise, it just means that there's actually more selling going on in the market than is visible by simply looking at these, you know, up and down volume. So over time, if there's more down volume going into a greater number of declining shares, it's going to be a little hard to detect just by looking at those numbers. And so what they do is they measure those and then they, the formula, uh, makes a determination that there's a trend here, either positive or negative. In this case, a negative trend indicates is indicated when it's going when empty volatility is going higher. So as the tr it, both, so both the trend and the level of empty volatility is very important. Uh, when it's going higher, that typically means there's more selling coming into the market. Um, and when it gets to a level of about 90 to 100%, that indicates that there's a lot of selling coming into the market. And so we see here back on August 2nd, that volatility was rising from the 84 to 87 to 88 to 90. And then it can, it, as it started getting a little bit higher, 90, 93, 96, the market started pulling back because it was registering the fact that there was actually more selling in the market than is visible just through the through the numbers. And once we reached 103%, it looks like it was kind of a peak of that selling pressure, and then that pressure started to decline, and uh, we started to get a rally once it fell below 100% again. Uh, but that 100% number is kind of like the, it's almost like a zero line. Uh, you can think of the 100% as a zero line from positive to negative. And let me just pull up my board here and I'll show you what I mean. 
So instead of thinking of it as a 100%, you could think of it as a zero line. And so once it's above that 100% or rising, then that's, that's very bearish territory. And when it's below 100% or the zero line, then it's bullish. And so it's not only, it's not only the level, but that 100% level is very, very important but it's also the trend. So if it's trending lower, especially once it gets down below 90%, it's much more bullish. And if it's above 100%, and especially above 110%, then it's extremely bearish. Okay, um, and then the pipeline, what the pipeline does is it measures in three different stages what's happening with empty volatility. So it's kind of like an early warning system, like they say, about empty volatility. So a lot of times we can get a, um, uh, the pipeline is different measurements of the formulas that go into empty volatility, and you can kind of get an idea. Once it starts rising, you know that empty volatility is gonna start rising as well. And so it kind of gives you a heads up that in fact, empty volatility is gonna start rising or it's gonna start declining. So like right now, we've got the pipeline starting to look white here uh, and white white cells indicate a positive trend red cells indicate a negative trend a negative trend uh, typically starts out this way so you start out with a third column and they do separate the columns but the most important column is the third column because most of the trends in price and empty volatility start in the third column uh, when that starts turning red, then you can generally get an indication that uh, selling is starting to rise, start, selling is starting to come into the market, and typically empty volatility will follow that and, and rise as well. The flow is simply the average of these three columns. And so it kind of gives us a quick view of what potentially could happen to empty volatility in the future. When that starts to rise, then we know that there's potential selling coming into the market. And when it peaks, uh, like it looks like it did last week on Wednesday, uh, it was at 145%, or was that Monday? That's Monday. Uh, at 145% in the third column, uh, they sent out a, a release set, or a uh, update uh, that night saying that there's a potential peak here at 145%. Now, 145% is pretty big, but it's not the biggest that we've seen. If we go back uh, into the pipeline, you can see there's a lot of times where it's peaked right around that 140%. Uh, here's 148%, looks like it peaked out. Uh, here's one for 226%. That was back in March when the market was really, really weak. Uh, but it has gotten even higher than that. Uh, here's 274% uh, during February, the early February decline, uh, where the market you know, dropped two, four percent days. It hit 274% on the first day that it was down a thousand points or more. The second time it was down a thousand points or more it was only 232. So it indicated to them, and this is in the guide as well, that the selling was a lot less. So there was less selling. If, if the pipeline third column was higher than 274% on this day, then the selling probably would have continued, but it wasn't. So there was a divergence between that third column number and this third column number on this day uh, with an approximate point different uh, point um, decline of the same magnitude, uh, but there was less selling actually in the market. And you can take a look at that as well as with flow. So it flows 222, 222% uh, here on this day, and it was only 198% on this day. So that divergence is something that they look for, and it indicated to them that selling was probably over, and then we had a fairly significant rally afterwards. Okay, um, so typically what happens is the, um, uh, the pipeline third column, it starts to turn red, it indicates that potential market decline coming. And it, the, best, the best formation is that it starts in the third column, expands to the second column, and it continues into the first column. 
And so there's a nice stair step here between the third, the second, and the first column. Um, typically when the, um, when the danger is over, if you will, if you can see, if you look at the red cells as a dangerous time, a, a, a time in which there's a potential for a market decline, once that peaks, you start to get the white cells again. And typically, again, it starts in the third column, works to the second column, and then comes down to the first column. Um, and then when that happens and it hits a particularly, you know, uh, extreme low, you could probably look at that almost like an oscillator saying, okay, we hit a peak here. Now we've hit a low 48% in the third column. We're probably going to start rising again. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, it doesn't always mean that the market will decline, but it just means that you should probably be a little bit more cautious and that the potential for a decline is still there. Uh, the one thing that, so it only, tell, it only gives you an idea of the environment that you're in. So the pipeline uh, is an early warning system for empty volatility. Um, a lot of times in this case, uh, we had a lot of red in the pipeline indicating potential selling, uh, there's a lot of potential selling going on in the market but it never came through, empty volatility never rose above 100%, so it was fairly well contained. Plus, they never look at it alone. They always look at it in conjunction with bullish and bearish herding. So if there's no bullish herding or bearish herding in this case, uh, there was no bearish herding really to speak of, empty volatility didn't rise above 100%. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind about the pipeline is that it, it warns of a potential uh, decline, uh, but you always take a look at empty volatility and bearish herding to and, and bullish herding to confirm the fact that there is um, uh, there is or it has a potential for the market to decline. Um, and then we get to the bullish and bearish herding. Bullish and bearish herding is a uh, formula that they use. In order to, to is a lot of the formulas for determining bullish and bearish herding have to do with these numbers. So the up, vol, uh, up volume ratio, the down volume ratio, share ratio, and um, the down share ratio, and the sequences. So those sequences are put into uh, the bullish and bearish herding columns, and what they do is they measure the. the It's the strength of the move. So if there's a really strong up move, you're going to have more of these columns filled. There's six columns across. The more columns that are filled, the, the greater the um, uh, bullishness. Uh, a lot of times you see something like this in the bearish herding. You've got one little, uh, you've got a, this one is filled in on the bearish herding, and we did decline 219 points on that day on the Dow, but it was left as an orphan. An orphan is just like a little single bullish or a bearish, uh, in this case, um, that filled in the, of the first cell, but it never expanded. It never formed into a bearish run on the market. It didn't have anything behind it. It was just kind of all by itself. And so the market after that continued to go higher. So a well-formed bullish or bearish herd starts typically in this first column and then expands from that first column to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, and to the sixth. And when that happens, that means, it, especially once it gets past the first, second, or third column, that means that there's more and more buying going on in the market. And, uh, and, and so when you start to see a cluster like this, it indicates that there's a lot of bullish herding uh, we haven't had a lot of bearish herding lately, and we did back in February, but most of them are kind of sparse, and they're not really well-formed. In the guide, it shows you how what a well-formed bullish or bearish herding pattern looks like. We haven't had that very much um, since February. But even February, I think this is, this is, this is March, even the March decline here, which was pretty severe, uh, was not extremely well-formed. It was kind of spotty. 
There's, there's like entire days where there was no bearish herding whatsoever. And so when that happens, um, and then you get these clusters like this that are not well formed and they're kind of sparse in between, you can kind of, you have the idea that there's, hey, there's probably going to be um, a, a bull run coming, a uh, bullish uh, advance, especially when you use it in conjunction with a peak in the pipeline and flow. Um, so that's that's something that I always look at. I always look at, you know, is the bear shirting well formed? Is it, or is it sparse? Is it kind of like open? There's a lot of open uh, cells here. Or is it clustered? Uh, clustering is much, much better. Uh, so this was a really well formed bearish herding uh, beginning here uh, back in February or late January when the market declined significantly. We had some warning signs in the pipeline that they're selling some coming into the market. The other thing they look for is this third column on the bullish herding. Um, once it reaches down to the sixth column and there's no there's a huge hole here in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth columns. Um, they call this a long tail formation. And when you get a some bearish herding at the same time, you see bullish herding in the sixth column, this little pattern right here, that indicates what they call a long tail. And that means that there's probably a good amount of selling coming into the market. And it's passing from the bullish side to the bearish side. And so when you saw that, you can say, hey, yeah, there's, there's, really, there's, there's something going on here that I should probably pay attention to. And if I have a long portfolio, I should probably take protection. Or if I'm a trader, I'm going to take a short position. And of course, that worked out really, really well. And this was a, um, this was a pretty decent formation here on the, on the bearish side. Um, uh, but we haven't had really anything since then. Uh, we've had a lot of, we've had some bearish herding, but it's been really spotty. Uh, so you really want to take a look at those clusters. Um, and that's how bullish and bearish herding works, and that's how generally I use it. Um, and then we come to the trend, which is simply a 13-day, I believe, or 11-day, I'm not sure. But it's 11-day average of the strength indicator. The strength indicator is a measurement almost like momentum. So if, and that is also one of the TOS indicators um, that they developed recently. So <clears throat> like yesterday, um, let's go back to yesterday, just to give you an example. We opened up pretty good. Um, empty, uh, the supply demand was up around 10. Uh, had a very nice up move here. We kind of pulled back a little bit. And right here, you can see that we were still positive on supply and demand, but more importantly, the strength index was still turning positive. It was still positive and it, and it started trending more and more positive. So it's almost like momentum behind the move. So this was a fairly decent move uh, lower, but we were still positive on both the strength and the uh, supply and demand. The strength index will tell you that, hey, there's, there's momentum behind this move. And so that's what the strength index does. This tells you the amount of buying and selling going on in the market. This tells you if there's strength behind the move. A lot of times I've seen the supply demand index go up and I've seen the strength go down. And when that happens, when that strength index goes down and it's opposite the supply and demand, it looks like there's buying coming in, but the movement of the uh, uh, the movement of the money or the movement of the momentum behind that move is weak, and so that typically means that the market is going to decline. Uh, so when you're taking a long position or a short position, if you're just doing day trading. Uh, with any of the futures contracts or with any of the ETFs or anything like that, you want to have both of these moving in the same direction. And typically, you only want to be in a long position when these are positive, and you only want to be in a short position when both of these are negative and trending lower, and in a long position when both of these are positive and trending higher together.
uh, that'll give you the most um, uh, that'll give you the most accurate indication of the future direction of the market. Uh, you focus on ST for reversal? Yes, I do. Um, if I was looking at um, so let's let's take a look at it right now. So we're starting to see a downward trend in the strength index. Uh, we've got an upward to kind of flat uh, in the supply and demand. So I'm not going to trust this move here. This move does not appear like it's going to, um, it, at least it doesn't look like it's sustain sustainable at this point, especially if we get a downward movement in the strength index. Um, things will start, if it gets closer to the zero line, that means the strength is almost at zero. So the strength of the move itself is being eroded and once we get to the zero line and we start going negative, then the market will probably go negative as well. So I would use strength. I would use strength as a potential reversal, but as long as it's still positive though, it would ha it still means that the market will probably continue to move higher. It's only when it's on a very sharp trajectory downward that I would call a reversal in the market. Um, and if the if the market was higher and the strength index was moving down at a very sharp rate then I would not trust that move higher at all. And that would be an excellent opportunity to um, take, take a short position. Um, okay, so that's what the strength index, you're welcome. Yep, no problem. Uh, so that's what the strength index, it's really a momentum. And it also shows that, and we there is a benchmark in the guide. So the benchmark basically in the guide says, if the Dow is up 100 points, this should be, the strength should be one. Uh, yesterday or the day before it was up 110 points and the strength index was 1.88 that's a strong indication that that was a pretty positive move uh, yesterday it was up 89 points uh, but the strength index was only 0.15 so at 89 which is very close to 100 this the strength index should have been closer to 1 it wasn't it was only 0.15 um, you could multiply that by 10 and get this is one of the tricks I use um, I multiply it by 10 and I say, okay, if the strength index is 0.15 and I multiply it by 10, uh, or 100, I guess, in this case, uh, well, 10. Uh, so I I'm, taking off the, I'm taking off the decimal point, I'm taking off the zero, I'm saying, okay, the market should be up 15 points. And it was up 89. So I don't really trust that move. So the move was actually, I mean, the move was pretty strong on the, on the price side, but there wasn't a lot of strength behind it. In this case, it was up 1.88. Well, it was up 110, so that's, pro that's pretty close. In fact, the market could have been up, it was so strong, it could have been up a couple hundred points. Uh, this one was really weak, which was kind of surprising, but uh, the market was up 396 points. Strength index was only plus 0 0.05, so it was highly suspect. Um, but you know, it still ended up working out the next day. The next day was up very strong. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is that traders see the market up 396 points. They come in the next day, they start buying, but they should have pushed it up to 188 points. They didn't, they only push, pushed it up to 110. Um, so that's the way I look at it. I look at it as kind of a divergence between the actual price decline to see if it equals the, uh, the change in the Dow. So here the market was down 137 points. The Dow was down 137 points. The strength index was minus 1.17, which is about right. Should have been down about 117 points. That's pretty close. Um, okay, then the swing signal al algorithm uses a lot of different, it probably has, uh, I'd say close to 100 different calculations in the spreadsheet to determine the algorithm. Um, other than that, I don't know that much about it. All I know is they use almost all of the different uh, uh, columns, the ones that are hidden, the ones that are uh, visible, and they use it in that calculation to make a determination if the market is, you know, looking weak or looking strong, um, and then create the algorithm, route, algorithm from that. Um, the 21 and 20... 27 day sum is not technically a market timer indicator. I mean, it's basically just 
a sum of the price change of the Dow over a 21-day period. It's the sum of it. It's not an average. It's the sum. And the 27-day sum, same thing. It's 27-day sum of the Dow. They've been using that for years, they said, and they decided to include it on the spreadsheet because they found that there is a uh, cycle, a price cycle of 21 days and 27 days uh, in the market. And they typically will, and what they did was they highlighted it when it's at a high point um, uh, on the 21 day sum and on the 27 day sum. And they also highlight on the low end, which I don't think we see until we get down here um, which was back in April and February. So it indicates that there, these are extreme price moves and typically those extreme price moves are either going to bring sellers into the market or buyers. In this case, they're gonna bring buyers into the market uh, at these extreme price levels. And, um, and when, they, when we get to you know, these upper areas up around 2000 plus 1500 to 2000, points in a 21 or 27 day period, then it's gonna bring sellers into the market. And they've used it successfully over the years. Um, it hasn't changed, it's been 21 and 27 days. So I don't know, they just included that. I think it's a pretty good indicator, I like it. Uh, Eucharist asks, how did the swing signal show, how the swing signal show be trained? Uh, if this is up on, say, Monday, then change it down on Wednesday. We go long Monday and close the position on Wednesday. Okay. Um, well, the swing signal can be used intraday as far as... Uh, I have not used it intraday. Uh, typically, I use the strength indicators, the TOS scripts. Um, but you can, when you update the spreadsheet during the day, you can you can see if there's going to be a change in the swing algorithm during the day. So I guess if I was to do it, I'd take a reading about once an hour just to see if there's a change in the signal. And then if there's a change in the signal and it lasts like more than, I don't know, like it lasts till the end of the day and it's down. So let's say you take a reading at 9 o'clock in the morning or uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and then you take another one at 12 and it turns down. If it stays that way till about three o'clock, then you might want to take a short position on that. Um, does that help? No, well, I, the only reason I would check market timer is uh, because of this because of the scripts now. I, I would not manually enter the data into market timer, uh, Jeff, because the scripts for the supply and demand. The, the two things that um, affect intraday trading the most is going to these to be the supply and demand index and the strength indicator. Um, I might, if there's, if I think there's a transition going on in the market, I might update it during the day just to take a look at the pipeline and empty volatility. Uh, but otherwise, if I'm doing just day trading, I wouldn't check it. I would not uh, enter the data into the market timer spreadsheet. Uh, I'd only typically be using the scripts. Uh, yeah, when there's a huge gap between the two of these, that typically means that there, the, uh, there's, it's going to revert. So, in other words, um, let's see if I can find a really big gap here. Uh, yeah, there's a huge gap here. Uh, the 21 day was minus 622, and the 21 day was plus 65. So, when there's a really big gap between these two, then I would look for a reversal. And um, that was actually a pretty good indica indication on this day. On July 11th, uh, the Dow was down 219 points, and there was a huge gap between the 21 and the 27-day sum. In fact, it was building, so it was like here, it was a big gap, 
This wasn't a big gap here, but it started building a pretty big gap in conjunction with a low pipeline reading um, is probably a pretty good indication that the 21 day was going to catch up to the 27 day and go positive and we had a nice run over uh, the next week. So look for the gaps, the huge gaps. Here's another huge gap. Uh, this time the 21 day sum was at 1240 and the 27 was at 535. And so it was about a 700 point gap between these two. Uh, in that case, I would anticipate that the 21 day would catch up with the 27 day again and the market would decline and it did decline over the next four or five days. So when you see a huge gap, like right now, we don't have a very big gap at all. It's about 130 points. I would say a gap of 500 points or more um, is probably something that you should pay attention to as we get closer to turning points in the market. Um, that's typically the way I use it when there's, you know, when we're close to a turning point in the pipeline. Um, and there's a huge gap between the 21 and 20 day sub uh, of about 500 points or more, I'd say. Um, if it is a swing signal, it should be traded for swing traded, not day trading. So my logic would be to open a trade Monday at the open based on the swing signal. And if on Monday close, it remains unchanged. We should leave the trade open and close the trade when the signal changes to close the trading day. Yeah, typically, um, because it is, because it typically uses the end of day trading, end of day data, uh, but you can do it during the day. I would say that, so for example, if there was a up signal that occurred yesterday um, or Friday, whatever time during the day that it turned from negative to positive, so it turned from down to up, it's probably a safe bet that that signal, as long as it was stable for that day and it kept staying positive throughout the, throughout the day, that it would be safe to take a position over the next couple of days. The swing signal is not a day trading signal. The strength indicator is basically used for that. The swing signal is a uh, signal that pretty much stays stable over two to three day period, or maybe even longer. So yeah, that, abs that absolutely makes sense. So if you were in a swing trade, I would get into it when the signal changes. So when it went from negative to positive this day, uh, and it stayed positive for a few hours, then yeah, that's and then you would want to stay in it for at least a couple of days. Absolutely. Um, when you say catch up in either direction. So, well, the catch up is between the 21 and 20 day sum, 27 day sum. Since the 21 day sum is a shorter duration than 27 day sum, 27 day sum uh, is typically, it's a little bit of a longer term. It's a six day difference, right? So the sum of that is going to be a little bit different when the 21 day sum runs too fast or too hot in one direction, either up or down, you get this, you get these gaps. And so what it means is that, you know, eventually the 21 day sum is going to become the 27 day sum. So in this case, the 21 day sum is probably going to revert back to the 27 day sum um, in about six days in the future. So in this case, it's too, it's running too fast and it's going to decline in order to catch up, to close that gap. Uh, Donnie asks off topic, swing traded with MT video. Uh, the swing trade video is basically using the 21, 21 day sum and the 27 day sum um, and using that in conjunction with the uh, in conjunction with the pipeline flow. So I'll go into more depth on that in the, in a video. I have not done the video yet. I'm just, uh, I've just been packed with uh, too much stuff to do. Uh, but that's basically it. So when you see a peak, so let's go to, yeah, let's go to here. So if you see the pipeline at 145, 
Uh, and then you take a look at the um, you take a look at the 21 and 27 day sum. The 21 day sum is at 169, and the 27 day sum is at 828. It's higher, right? And so if that's peaking, then this 21 day sum is going to catch up with that 828. So what happens is that the 21 day sum is, is oversold. You could think of it as being oversold in comparison to the average, the 27 day sum. And so it's going to catch up. Well, what happens is if you took a long position here, you'd be up very nicely. So the swing, uh, taking swing positions with market timer is basically looking at the flow, looking at the 21, 27 day sum, and saying, okay, if that's peaking and we've got a huge gap uh, between the 21 and 27 day sum, the 21 almost always tries to catch up to the 27, the market's going higher. Yeah, I'll uh, actually, I'll do a separate video. I'll, I'll put it all together so that you guys have a better idea of exactly what I'm talking about. But I'll use a couple of, I use a couple of different things with the pipeline 21, but the pipeline mostly, uh, that third column, right? See, like right now, we're hitting, we got a 57% on the pipeline. That's really low in that third column. Uh, we don't necessarily have a peak in the 21, 27 day sum, though. Uh, the, the gap is closed here. Um, I guess if we had this 57% with this gap up here, I would say, you know, this is a good opportunity probably to go short. Um, but we're not. We're in a different situation here. So you have to kind of wait for a really good setup. Um, could you go over there in steps what you are looking for when you're going to get into an intraday? Uh, getting an intraday in a conference? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. You're looking for when you're getting into an intraday intraday trade. Yes, I'll do it in a separate session. Okay, so um, if I was looking at intraday trade, so I'm taking a look at today. Uh, if I was going to take a look at this today, uh, okay, I still have this position on. Okay, good. Um, here's my setup. In fact, um, Jeff, did you see the uh, video I put out yesterday? I did some trading in the morning. Okay. So I kind of went over that yesterday. You can look at it, but I'll go over it again here just briefly. Um... What I do is, now you can, I use this with YMN and Q. Those are the two I primarily trade. Uh, but you can use this with any futures contract or ETF or whatever you want to use. I measure off the first five minute bar. I'll take this first five minute bar and I'll just draw a rectangle around it and extend it out into the trading session. Um, and I'll do that for whatever instruments, instruments that I'm using. I did it on the NASDAQ, I did it on the YM, and I do that every single day. Then I take a look at the open of the market timer supply demand index and the strength index. Um, and what I want to see is the, uh, the supply demand index opening on the positive side. And I want to take a look at the strength index to see if it opens on the positive side. And then I typically do not take a trade in the first 15 minutes. I want to see what the trend looks like. Uh, in this case, 
the trend was immediately higher. And the supply demand index continually went higher as well. And then it started leveling off and declining a little bit. But the strength index is, is moving lower. So I'm not going to take a position, at least on this index. The reason I like to look at two, I mean, besides the, the pair trading that I'm doing, the, uh, the arbitrage between the Y and the NQ, I like to have another instrument up here that I like to trade. And I want to see which one is stronger. And so it looks like at this point, the uh, NQ is a little bit stronger. The supply and demand is at seven. Um, they're pretty close, but the YM is at 6.3. And you can use these as a direct comparison. So if this was 10 and this was three, then the YM is gonna be stronger than the uh, NQ. And if the day is up, uh, so the other thing I use is the, um, uh, is, where is it? This one, uh, no, sorry, this one. So the other indicator that I use is this, at least for the YM. And I'll put this up here. I want to see how MTXL, the Market Timer Excel script, opens. Because this is going to give me an overall sense of the market. Yeah, we're going higher. Um, there's not much separation between the advancing issues and the, de and the de advancing uh, volume. So that's a good sign. The market is probably going to continue to go higher unless I start to see both of these sharply lower. Now, right now, it looks like we're getting a little more selling coming into the market. The, the number of advancing issues is starting to decline a little bit. But it's still positive. In fact, it's positive by a pretty good degree. But the strength index is not keeping up. So if I was doing any kind of day trading at all, number one, is I want to, and the reason why I have two issues up here, even for day trading, is I want to compare the relative strength of both of these. If I was going to go take a long position, which is the right position to take today, especially when the market is up, I want to buy the stronger of the two. I don't want to be, I don't want to go long the YM if it's weaker than the NQ. The difference is that we've got the NQ supply and demand at seven. We've got the YM at 6.3 already. Uh, it looks like the NQ is gonna be stronger. In addition, we've got the strength index, which looks like it's continuing to move higher, had a little bullet lower, but it's continuing to move higher as opposed to the YM strength index is continually moving lower during the same time period. So I always wanna be in the strongest of these two and if I measure them, you know, this is 0.71 and declining. This is 1.45 uh, and, and going higher. I want to be in the stronger one. So I would go long the NASDAQ. I would go long NQ. And that's my basic setup. Now, the reason I put this rectangle around the five-minute chart is I want to see, is it staying above that first five-minute bar? And by how much? Um, in this case, the Dow is uh, the YM is above that five-minute bar, which is a positive sign. Uh, but the NQ is above the five-minute bar by a little bit more of a margin. And as long as it stays above that five-minute bar, then it's probably a pretty good long position to take as long as the strength indicator continues to move higher. Um, in this case, a lot of times what will happen is this, uh, the, uh, the uh, futures will come back to that five-minute bar. As long as it doesn't break through 50% of that, then it's still a good long position. So I may even put, if I'm doing just day trading alone, I'll just put a measurement in there and say, okay, it cannot go below that 50% mark of that first five-minute bar, otherwise it's going to... It should be, by that time, the strength index is probably going to be, you know, looking something like this. <laughs> it should be going down at least. Um, but if it doesn't, if it stays relatively strong, if it stays relatively steady here, right around 1.4 or above, and, we pull, and the price pulls back down to this level, 
that's a great buying opportunity. So if the strength index stays steady, uh, the supply demand stays steady, we get a little bit of a pullback right into that 50% level, then that's a great long position to take. I wanna make sure that if there is a pullback in price, uh, that there's no real damage to the supply demand line or the strength index. Um, if that does not happen, if there is, if it does look like there's a tremendous amount of weakness coming into the uh, supply demand like this, and the strength index, you know, starts to head towards the negative area, then that's a sure sign of reversal, and we're probably gonna we're gonna go lower from this point. So. You want these two to agree. You want the strength index and the supply and demand index both heading higher or at least stable. And then price will fluctuate around that, uh, up and down a little bit. If we do get a little decline in price, like I said, but this stays steady, this stays steady, that's a great long position to take. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. And you can also watch the video yesterday, Jeff. Sure. Um, let's see, I know that there was one other question in here. Um, okay, Charlie asks, for the ARB trade, do you take long YM, short NQ when MTXL arbitrage oscillator indicator is positive and short YM and NQ if it's negative? Yeah, it has to be trending that way though, so I don't use it in isolation. Um, if I've got a, if the oscillator is going positive, I want to see if that number is going higher, if it continues to go higher here, if it continues working higher. Um, if it's fluctuating like it is now, right around that zero line to the plus, to the negative, uh, there's no real trend here. And typically, um, the oscillator, the movement in the YM and NQ trade is generally done in the first I mean, the, the trend itself is established in the first 15 minutes of trading. Um, <coughs> I don't take really short positions on this, but a lot of times, like yesterday, I was out in 15 minutes. It was very, very quick. Um, I mean, the move was made. It was very fast. Today, it was a little, it's a little more choppy. Um, in fact, I'm going to get out of this position now. Not a, huge, not a huge mover today, but, you know, pretty decent. So I'll just go ahead, that's 175, and um, that's 15, so it's 190. I'm just going to get out of here. You know, 190 a contract is not bad, but it's pretty easy money. Um, so yes, if, if the indicator is positive, but the other thing I look at, which is really, really important, <coughs> excuse me, um, is this one. So in today's case, when we opened, it was a little bit positive, but both the arbitrage uh, supply and demand, which is not available yet, actually it's still in beta, uh, but I'm testing it out pretty successfully. Uh, if that turned out negative today, even though the spread uh, went higher, uh, it was negative along with the ARB uh, strength index was negative. And so I took a short position, which is uh, short YM, long NQ, just like you said. Uh, looks like it's starting to turn around a little bit right now, but nothing. So I use these in conjunction. Now, this is the three-line arbitrage script that I showed you, uh, I think, before they released uh, the, uh, the uh, TOS indicators. And somebody asked if we, I would include the, uh, the three-line arbitrage script because they like that. And um, um, uh, so I told Strong Market about that. I, I told the guys over there. And they have included it now in the package. So uh, the only thing that you don't have yet is the arbitrage uh, supply-demand script for the arbitrage. Uh, but that will be available by the end of the week. But the three-line indicator, the three-line arbitrage uh, script that I showed you guys uh, a few weeks ago is now in the package. So if you haven't downloaded the package in a while, uh, go back and download it because that three-line is in there now.
Uh, Market Timer Insight Weekly is the model tables on the last few pages. Uh, do you put much observation weight into those? They kind of confuse me. Uh, the model tables, the model tables, model tables. Uh, you mean the um, you mean the long term outlook, Pete? Uh, Eucharist, is this the YMNQ arbitrage that you're explaining? Well, at first I started to talk about the day trading, and then I started talking about the arbitrage. So, Pete, are you talking about the um, the long-term uh, tables, the long-term outlook? If you're talking about the long-term outlook, they, um, they, they are long-term though. So I mean, they're, they're basically uh, sums of the MTSD, the, um, uh, the sums of the, um, uh, the bearish and bullish herding, the balance of power. Um, I, if, you're, if you're a short-term trader, swing trader, you don't really need to pay attention to those very much. All right, guys, it's 11.10. Um, we're going to wrap up here, but I appreciate you joining me again today. And um, I'll see you again on Thursday, I believe. Um, I'll check my schedule, but I think I can make it Thursday. Hope you guys have a great day, and um, I'll talk to you again soon.